Welcome to the United Church of Resonant. Good morning. Our meditation is, how does it encourage you to know that God isn't affected by what someone may say or think about you? How will you celebrate his perfect love today? If you could join me in the call to worship, which is Psalm 23 this morning. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. If you could all stand and sing, The King of Love, My Shepherd Is, can be found in the Pilgrim Hymnal on page 80.
If you could remain standing and join me in the invocation in Lord's Prayer. O, o divine, divine Master, Master grant, grant that, that I may, may not so much seek to be, be consoled as, as to console, to be understood as to understand, understand to be loved as to love. For it is, is in giving that we receive, it is in pardoning that we, that we are pardoned, and it is and in dying, dying that we are born to eternal life. We pray as Jesus taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. seated. The announcements can be found on the back of the bulletin. Today the flowers on the altar are given by Joe and Becky McGuire in loving memory of Ray and Helen Allard. Thank you. Uh, we are pretty much full for flowers until the beginning of June. The first week in June is um, taken, but if anybody wants to sign up for the summer um, services, we will welcome that. Please sign up for hosting a coffee hour on the sign-up sheet in Fellowship Hall. There will be an Old Colony Association meeting at the Lakeville United Church of Christ, 1 Precinct Street, this Tuesday, May 2nd at 7, and all are invited to attend. We will be having a luncheon next Sunday after church, and Carolyn wants to expand on that. So it's what we'd love to have them. So 
may have been you know, mentioned to Julia, you know, if your son comes out of business, it's fine, bring him to, you know what I mean? It's, and uh, the Brady's called the other day, they're going to come up. Uh, so that should be fun, they said they want to see you. Sure, why not, you know? Um, it just helps spread the word, and we'll, uh, we'll try to be nice. Yeah. Yes. Uh, making coffee right now, it's, uh, but I came a little late, so it's a little. I was wondering why you were staying back there. I'm like, what's going on with Donna? <laughs> so we will have fellowship down in cut. Yeah, my kids, we have chips and two sundaes yesterday, so Thanks, Donna. <laughs> and we are still collecting food for the um, Freetown in Berkeley um, pantry, if anyone wants to bring some in and leave it in the narthex. And if you have any concerns or suggestions, if you want to talk to the Pastoral Advisory Committee, and Reverend Baker's blog is listed here, and he is available on Fridays in his office if anyone wants to make an appointment. Do I have any other announcements? Thank you. All right. So I just wanted to uh, update or uh, make a little bit of an extension of the uh, announcements that we had. Uh, first off, uh, I'm very excited about the meal uh, next week. And I know Carolyn's put a lot of uh, time and uh, emotional effort into the whole thing. And it's funny that you mentioned communion because the way I look at it is that when we have communion, we sort of commemorate uh, two kinds of meals. The first one is the Last Supper the one that Jesus gave, uh, which represents his sacrifice and his crucifixion and his resurrection and the power of forgiveness. But the other one is, is that when we do have the meal, it represents all the other meals that Jesus had with people and with his disciples and all the meals that were so important to the early church. If you came to the uh, Lenten Bible study series uh, this past uh, couple months ago, you know that how important that e feeding with Jesus is so that when we gather together in Jesus' name and we share a meal together, we celebrate the Lord together, that is an essential part of what communion is all about. Yeah? So yeah. Many hands. Oh, absolutely. Thank you. Yeah. Any, uh, any all yeah, and I'm sure that that certainly thanks to Sue and to to Cheryl, um, and uh, I know that there's other people that have volunteered as well. So thank you. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Becky, thank you. <laughs> uh, a couple other things um, in terms of. The pastoral relations or advisory committee. Uh, just know that if you do have an issue, you don't have to necessarily go to through that committee. You can always just talk to me directly. I really appreciate any uh, feedback that you could give me. Um, <clears throat> in terms of the old colony association meeting, uh, this was something that kind of snuck up on me a little bit. But um, there, it is a business meeting where we're going to vote on you know new people on the various boards and committees and probably a budget. That part is not very interesting. But because they want other everyone to sort of guide, um, come together to celebrate um, all the other churches within the, the local region and the association, they're going to have a hymn sing after the business portion. And so if you'd like to come for the hymn sing, um, then I would certainly welcome everybody to come. I think that that would be delightful. And I know that I think a few people from the uh, Tuesday Bible Study Club, my uh, group, may be coming to do that as well. But if you are <clears throat> would like to maybe sing some old hymns that we don't always sing here in church or catch up and have meet some people you haven't seen for a while or make new friends with some people at the other churches, this is an opportunity to do so. And it's in Lakeville, so it's not very far away. And if there are no other announcements this morning, uh, it's now our time for our joys and concerns. <clears throat> we do have our continued prayers today for Anne-Marie Allen, for Dick Field, for Susan Lemos, for, <clears throat> excuse me, for Mary and for Leon Cudworth Sr., for Tiff and for Kim Vonica, <clears throat> for uh, Millie Moore and for Nick Riccardi, uh, for Bethany Costa and for Pat Gonsalves, uh, for Bobby Files and for Jack. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
uh, for uh, Tony Ribello and for Franklin McMullen and for David Brzezewski, for Naomi Dias. I had a prayer request today for Ed Torres. Um, he's having some health issues and he's uh, trying to make his way back from Florida with Sonny and I hope that um, we can, our prayers will help bring him uh, back to us as soon as possible. I have uh, another prayer request uh, today from uh, more on the personal side of things. I have a bunch of uh, friends down at a gaming store that I go to with my son and my, and my daughter so we can, uh, you know, play, you know, board games and, and role-playing games together. That's where I get all of my board games for board game night, P.S. and by the way. But uh, one of the guys who comes to the store regularly has had a lot of health problems and has been difficult working because of those health problems and he had uh, liver issues among other issues. And last night, uh, a couple days ago, he got the news that if he came in 3.30 in the morning on uh, Friday, he could get the liver transplant. So um, he, he was in surgery all day yesterday and uh, apparently it was successful, but he um, was belligerent coming out of the anesthesia and I know what that's like. <laughs> um, so he's in the recovery right now in Mass General Hospital. So his name is, uh, is Josh and I appreciate uh, your prayers both in Thanksgiving that he was able to find things and go through the surgery and also for his recovery. So thank you. Another thing I'd like to pray for today is for um, calm and peace for people in the world and to develop a sense of trust. Because I've heard many stories, and maybe they're just in the media this week, but a lot of stories of people in normal situations um, resorting quickly to violence when people knock on their door or turn into their driveway or make a noise complaint. And I just find that very disturbing. So I ask God to please grant us love for our neighbors in all the ways that God can. Are there any other prayer requests this morning? Yeah, Mary? I have an update on that. Because he's in remission. Mm -hmm. That is the answer. So that's such a blessing. Yeah. He has the moment right now, so he's trying to get over that. But he's for his father. Continue. Yeah, definitely praise God for the miracle of healing. Uh, Joanne, did you? Oh, sorry. Yeah, Pat. Uh, Good. Well, okay. <laughs> I guess all's well that ends well. Okay. Yep. So, well, certainly prayers for troubles and prayers for solutions for your granddaughter. Yes, Joan. That's Stan. Okay, so your friend's father is in the ICU? Okay. So certainly prayers for him today. Yes, Becky? I'd like continued prayers for my sister Eunice again. She's okay. struggling. She flew out and had the surgery. And this week we found out Joe's brother has cancer, so that's a mother. So Eunice needs a lot of prayers. Yeah. So uh, prayers for Joe's brother and his cancer, and we'll put Eunice back on our regular prayer list because uh, she's been there in the past, and it sounds like she needs a lot of help. Other prayer requests this morning? All right. Then let us uh, all uh, pray together. Holy and gracious God, you call us by name and beckon us to follow you. Fill our leaders with wisdom and patience, insight and mercy. Help them to lead with kindness and strength. Fill our hearts with the knowledge of you that we can turn from the distractions of life and be more like you. May we be agents of your compassion, offering kindness to those we meet. Like a shepherd tending the flock, you tend to our needs. Be present with those who struggle, suffer, are in pain or sorrow. Guide those who are lost or filled with worry and fear. 
Protect those who are in harm's way, heal those who are ill, and mend those who are broken as only your love can. We pray especially today for, for Anne-Marie and for Dick, for Susan and Mary, for Leon and Tiff and Kim, for Millie and for Nick, for Bethany and Bobby and Jack, for Tony and Franklin and David, for Naomi and Pat, for Ed and for Josh, for Eunice, for Joe's brother, for all of our friends who are mourning lost loved ones who are in the ICU. Hear the silent prayers of our hearts as we listen to your word for us. God of all blessings, we thank you for all the gifts of life, for your Son, our Savior, our Good Shepherd, the one who stands at the gate of all life's challenges and joys, calling us out in love. For all this and more we pray. Amen. So I heard a story the other day, and it's a story about a, about a pastor who goes to the grocery store, and sometimes when you're a pastor and you go to the grocery store, you kind of have your guard down a little bit. I you know, used to run into Sarah Witte in the grocery store all the time. <laughs> um, you know, and it's sort of like, what are you doing here? But in this story, uh, there's a pastor, and she's at the, um, She's walking through the grocery store and she sees a mother and a baby, baby daughter in the grocery store. And the baby's just, just crying. It's just, just having it, you know, just crying and crying and crying. And, and you know, she goes nearby because she's probably on the other side of the aisle. And the baby's crying and she hears the woman say, it's okay, Susie, I know you're upset. It's not a good idea to stop at the store right now, but, but in a few minutes, this will be finished and you, you can go home. You can have your favorite lunch, and, and I'll tuck you into bed for a nice nap. You know, don't cry, Susie. I love you. I'm here. It's okay. And she kept saying these words over and over to the child as they're walking through the store. And it turned out that they were, she was be, uh, the pastor was behind, you know, the, the mother and the child as they were going through the, the checkout. And as they're going out to the uh, parking lot, the pastor turns to the woman and says, you know, excuse me, I just want to say what a good job that you're doing. You're speaking so lovingly to your daughter when she was so upset. You're a really wonderful mother to Susie. And the young mother was kind of puzzled and said, oh, my daughter's name is Janet. I'm Susie. Yeah. And the pastor looks at her sort of, oh? And she says, yes, I was saying the words that I know Jesus would say to comfort me. I think we've all been in the situation where you're out in public with a child or with somebody else who's maybe not behaving quite as well as you'd like. Maybe it's a grocery store, maybe it's a church service, I don't know. But when those times happen, we also need love and support, not just the love that we give. And I, well, I like this story because it tells us about how God really does comfort us. Um, in the times we need, because sometimes we do need a pep talk. We do need to go that God loves us and supports us and will let us have a nap and go home and have our favorite lunch. No. The Lord is our shepherd, and God, Jesus tells us that we do a good job, that he, that he loves us, that he's here, and that it's all going to be okay. Can you uh, please pray with me? Dear Lord, thank you for your love. Thank you for always being with me. Amen. Right. So I have a question for you now. Um, how can we remember all of God's creation in our offering? God has given us grace and love. God has given us family and friends. God has given us this church. 
God gives us the, the warmth of summer and the, the colors of, of the autumn and the chill of winter, the new life and growth of the springtime, the April showers and the May flowers and I guess the pilgrims too. And so with all of this, we have a reminder of the new life that we have in God. And so we ask God at this time to accept our offering of love. This morning's offering will now be received. Let us pray. Our heavenly God, all we have is because of you. May the gifts we give this day become a blessing for your church, your community, your state, your nation, your world, empowering us to do the work which you call us. May our faithful giving be used wisely with each one's gift cherished and each one's need met. Continue to gather us at your table, which is not limited to our one church, but moves and breathes across all the varied worship spaces and places, across diverse cultures. May these gifts strengthen the bodies and nourish the spirits to bring glory to you. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.
Our hymn of preparation this morning is from the Black New Century Hymnal, and it is number 479, God is My Shepherd. That was one announcement that I left off. It's just that the book study on Revelations will be continued not this Tuesday, but the following Tuesday due to the meeting at Lakeville. The first reading is the New Testament lesson, Acts 2, 42 to 47, and can be found on page 802 in your pew Bible. They devoted themselves to the apostles, teaching the fellowship to the breaking of the bread and the prayers. All come upon everyone because any wonders, wonders and signs were done by the apostles. All who believed were together in all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. Day by day, as they spent much time together in the temple, they broke bread at home and ate their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having the goodwill of all people. And day by day, the Lord added to their number those who were being saved. And the Gospel lesson this morning is John 10, 1 to 10, and can be found on page 789 in your pew Bible. Very truly I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate but climbs in by another way is a thief and a bandit. The one who enters by the gate is the shepherd of the sheep. 
The gatekeeper opens the gate for him, and the sheep hear his voice. He calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them, and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. They will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. Jesus used this figure of speech with them, but they did not understand what he was saying to them. So again Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, I am the gate for the sheep. All who come before me are thieves and bandits, and the sheep did not listen to them. I am the gate. Whoever enters by me will be saved and will come in and go out and find pasture. The thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I come that they may have life and I have it in abundantly. Good morning again. How's everyone feeling this morning? I, I see some nodding heads. I'm taking that as a positive sign. You know, because I feel the presence of God in my life. And when I think about that, I, I think about that when, I've been, when I heard the 23rd Psalm today and the first two of three hymns, which are just the 23rd Psalm again. Because the 23rd Psalm is, is very meaningful to many people in many ways. For those of us who grow up in the church, it's one of the few pieces of scripture that we memorized. In other church traditions, there are long passages that are memorized, but in sort of our more um, you know, New England, uh, you know, congregational mainline tradition, uh, it's the 23rd Psalm is the one that we had to memorize when we were in Sunday school. You know, because we, we knew other parts of the Bible. We knew the stories of Noah and of Moses and of David and, of course, all of Jesus and all of the things he said and did in the disciples. But the one that we actually had to memorize was Psalm 23. And I think it's because of the way that Psalm 23 speaks to so many of our needs and concerns in such a short amount of space. In that way, I think it's a lot like the Lord's Prayer. The Lord's Prayer is sort of everything we would ever need to pray for is right there. I think Psalm 23 works in very much the same way. And the, there's a, uh, there's a um, spiritual discipline called Lectio Divina. I've mentioned it before. Has anyone ever done Lectio Divina before? So Lectio Divina is sort of where you take a Bible passage and you read it once and then you read it again and then you open yourself to what god might be calling you and you read it a third time and you think about how there's what phrase speaks to you and you read it a fourth time and you think about what is my response to god and to the world through what i have read and so when i performed like the divina on this psalm the one verse that one phrase that jumped out at me was i shall not want you know it's the idea that when i am in a right relationship with god there's really not anything else that i need and it's meaningful because there are in fact many things in life that we do need and that we do want and the psalm describes how god guides us he makes me lie down in green pastures he leads me beside still waters he restores my soul still waters how many times have we been in parched places in our lives because the world can be cruel and empty even when things seemingly are going well for us and our hearts may be troubled by the cruelty of the world around us the stories i was talking about earlier the little things like sort of the petty selfishness of other people the the fact that people turn their backs on us and and we turn our backs on them even in little ways even without even thinking about it the fact that we often feel like we're isolated from each other even though we live in close proximity with each other or when we can contact people from around the world at any moment in time with a push of a button 
And when we're not overwhelmed by the cares of the world and can see nothing else but those, things can still seem meaningless, like our lives have no purpose. I know that I felt this way from time to time, and I know a lot of people who don't have God feel this way a lot more than I do, because these times are rare for me because of my faith. God does bring me to that place of refreshment and peace. And it's not just true for when I have, or when we have inner crises of doubt or of fear. It's also true for when we are, um, there are outside forces that are against us. The Psalm says, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. And God protects us not just from our, our inner fears, which are beyond, but also things that are beyond our control, the cruelty of others. Even though I walk through the darkest valley, I fear no evil, for you are with me. In these darkest of times, when we face our mortality or the mortality of others, there is God. God is leading us through those times through all the struggles that we face, whether they're inner or external, whether they're natural or human-made. God is always there. So I was thinking back on that phrase, I shall not want. And I thought about all the times when I really leaned on God and trusted in God and all my fears melted away. And I thought back on uh, back to when my wife was diagnosed with cancer. And this was in 2012 or 2013, I, about 10 years ago. I can't even remember precisely when. It kind of feels like another lifetime. Now, my wife had always kind of struggled with her thyroid health. And during college, she had trouble staying awake, which is important when you're in college and you're trying to get all your work done. But only, and so she kept on going to the doctors and saying, there's something wrong with me, I'm always tired, I can't get my work done, I'm always, I don't, never, nothing ever feels right. And they said, oh, well, you're just overworking yourselves, or oh, your diet's not right. And nobody ever really listened to her, what she had to say. Finally, a doctor, excuse me, finally a doctor said, you know, I think you might have a problem with your thyroid, and they prescribed Synthroid to her. This is an artificial uh, Synthroid hormone. And she'd been on Synthroid when I met her back in 2001. And, you know, everything, and we'd been together for, you know, uh, for about a decade before her thyroid began to swell a little bit. And she became uh, worried. And then we went to the doctors and the diagnosis came in that she, in fact, had thyroid cancer. And I remembered that when we were engaged, my wife and I would playfully establish some rules that we'd have for when we were married. And one of the rules was... Uh, there, that we, there would be no cancer. That was the rule, no cancer. And yet here it was. Now, thyroid cancer is one of the best cancers you can get because it's relatively easy to treat and has a high survival rate. And this was contrasted with sort of an earlier experience that I had with cancer with a loved one. Uh, that was my mother's cousin who had stomach cancer. And over the course of about two weeks, she went from being my cousin to just wasting away into nothing. And so while things were not completely bleak in terms of the, this particular type of cancer, it was still a shock. It was still that thing where you think, oh, that's just something that happens to other people. And we were worried. And I began to imagine what life might be like without her. But then something happened. I stopped worrying. Maybe it's because I had trust in the, the medical establishment and in that statistically things were going to be successful. You know, maybe I was just in denial. I refused to let myself worry about it because I was being naive or just not, not engaging with those feelings. But looking back, I think it's because I felt the presence of God. I knew that God would save her. And I knew that even if she did die, that God would guide me through that as well. I figured that whether things were good or whether things were bad, I was going to be okay because God was with me. 
And so with my fear gone, or at least greatly diminished, I was able to focus on loving her and being supporting, supportive to her. And I remember that she, then she had her thyroid removed and she had radiation therapy. I remember she, uh, they, she went up to my parents' house. Uh, they, have, uh, you know, they have a relatively large house that has the upper floor, which is where me and my two sisters used to sleep. But since we all moved away and because we grew up, they had that whole upper level pretty much empty. So my wife was able to be up there for a week when she was too radioactive to be around other people. Yeah. And despite what I was joking about her, she in fact did not develop spider powers or the ability to turn green. Through it all, she remained my wife. And we remained ever faithful to God. And 10 years later, she is still cancer free. So why was I able to find peace with God when so many other people did not? I think it's because I heard the voice of God and I trusted. I think this is what Jesus talks about when he calls himself the shepherd of the sheep in the gospel according to John. Because to me, Psalm 23 speaks of a very personal point of view. It's from a, a mortal standpoint. You know, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. But Jesus speaks from a more external standpoint of people as a group. And Jesus speaks of a, a bunch of sheep, a herd of sheep in a fold who come in and out to graze and then return for, for safety in the evening. And this is, I think, clearly a metaphor for the daily needs and struggles that we have. We have to go out into the world, then we have to come back into ourselves to rest. And there's a danger coming in and coming out. But Jesus is the gate that we pass through and that perfects us. Jesus also says he is the shepherd of the sheep, the one who leads us in and out through life and into peace and love. Jesus says, he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out. When he has brought out all his own, he goes ahead of them and the sheep follow him because they know his voice. And when we hear the voice of Jesus, the voice of God, the one who created us and owns us, then we walk through life the way that we should. This is what the psalm means when it says, he leads me in right paths for his name's sake. Jesus contrasts this with other forces that pretend to lead people around. He says, I tell you, anyone who does not enter the sheepfold by the gate, but climbs in by another way is a thief and abandoned. And he says, they will not follow a stranger, but they will run from him because they do not know the voice of strangers. And he says, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. So who is this thief? You know, in, in the language of the Bible, you could say that this thief is the devil. And the devil is the one that comes to devour us, to capture our souls, to lead us to ruin, and certainly not to help us. When we listen to that voice, we find only destruction. But I think this thief also speaks to the false gods that we create for ourselves. We become our own thieves. We become our own strangers. And when it comes time to use these ideas or that we've created for ourselves to, to guide us towards those right paths, we cannot trust them. And so we just wander away. We wander into danger. We wander into despair. We wander into those dry places and we cut ourselves off from hope. We think that we're doing things that are going to make us happy. That, that if we follow those those ideas, and that, that's going to lead us to where, to those still waters, back to that sheepfold where we are loved and supported. But they never do. Only God leads us to those safe and refreshing places where we can find peace. God provides us with this, this inner calm and relief and helps us to face the troubles of the world. But the truth is that we also need more worldly 
assistance. And I believe that God, for example, worked through the hands of those doctors to help my wife. But it was still the doctors who were the ones that actually did the action. And it reminded me of the old joke about the man in the flood. Do you all remember that one? I've used it in the past. So the story is a man lives in a house and the whole region is flooding and everybody is, is evacuating the area and the man says, no, I'm not going to evacuate. I, I, God will rescue me. God will save me. And so then the waters begin to rise and the neighbors are coming and it's beginning to, to get above the tires and the neighbor says, hey, get into the car. Let's get out of here. And the man says, no, I know that God will save me. And then now the streets are flooded and the water is halfway up the house and a guy comes by in his boat and says, sir, sir, get in the boat. I'll take you to safety. And the man says, no, no, no. I trust in God. God will save me. And now the water rises up to the roof and he's standing on the roof and there's a helicopter, rescue helicopter overhead. And it says, sir, come, come in. You've got to get out of here. And he says, no, no, no. I believe in God. God will save me. And the water rises up and he drowns and he goes to heaven. And he's very angry and he says to God, God, I've believed in you my entire life. Why didn't you save me? And what does God say? What did he say? He said, who do you think sent the car and the boat and the helicopter? Right? It, God doesn't always magically save us. God doesn't always sort of cause the the, the, back, the virus to change or the body to heal itself more than it naturally would. Sometimes we experience God's mercy and grace and love and peace through what other people do. And this is hard because not everybody follows the voice of the shepherd. Some people actively act like thieves and try to hurt people. They prey upon our trust. And other people are in such dry places in their lives that they can't get out of their own way, much less help other people. But I think there is a way that we can find support from people in our moments of direst need. I think our lesson from the Acts of the Apostles demonstrates this. It tells of the days that were right after Pentecost, which of course is when the Holy Spirit comes down to the disciples and then sends them out to preach the word to the crowd and many that day come to believe and were baptized, and that was how the church originally formed. But then what happened? How were the lives of these new people actually changed? And Acts says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and fellowship, to the breaking of bread and the prayers. In other words, they, they listened to the voice of the shepherd, known through the disciples and, and the, the scriptures, and then they find refreshment and peace in that trust. They find the fellowship. They break bread together. But it takes things a step further because they don't just stop at finding this inner meaning of friendship. It says, all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distributed the proceeds to all as any had need. Now this was a display of ultimate trust in God and really ultimate trust in other people as well. And when you think about it outside of, you know, monks or sort of those people that go off in communes in the woods, this is not something that we normally see as part of our life. It's not something we can realistically uh, imagine that, that people would give up everything that they had to share with others with the expectation that others would share everything that they had with them. And yet this is what happened in the church. And this, in a lot of ways, is what we are, in fact, called to do. Now, this utopian relationship where everybody shared everything did not last very long as the church grew. By the time you get to the rest of Acts and Paul, it's very clear that this is no longer how the church is fully living. But the idea, the principle of this generosity persists. Because we are called to sacrifice some of our comforts, some of our, what we have, for the sake of others. And when we give to a church, we do that so that everybody can enjoy those benefits. We know that we will find the support that we need when we are in trouble. 
through the many people that we find here, not just in this congregation, but in other local congregations and indeed the, the church universal. You know, the people that help us may be cancer surgeons or rescues, rescuers with helicopters, but they're more likely they're people that can just offer us a helping hand, cook a meal for us, like rotisserie chickens, and give us a, a shoulder to cry on. When we believe in God, that allows us to believe in each other and find that relief that too often we don't find on our own. So when we live, love each other as a church or as a society which is uplifted by the presence of God, that is when we do not want. As the psalm says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord my whole life long. Let us pray. Loving shepherd, guide us through the dark valleys and shadows of death and let our faith persist in you always. Write your word of peace on our hearts. Help us memorize it and speak it every day. As we pray in Jesus' name, amen. So this leads us to our closing hymn and our last singing of Psalm 23. This version is in the Black New Century Hymnal and it is number 247. My shepherd is the living God. Please rise if you're able and let's all sing together.
So now follow God's example as dearly loved children and walk in the ways of love just as Christ loved us and gave himself for us as a fragrant offering and a sacrifice to God. Go in the name of God. Know that God walks with you always. Amen. Blessed be the tie that binds our hearts in Christian